welcome to Scratch Storytelling. Um, to sort of introduce what we're going to do today, I'm going to show you an example of a nor another story that I made during one of these um, training sessions. And this one's called A Desert Tale, and the instructions for it just say click on the sprites to interact. So let's get started. If I click on the cactus, it asks me what my name is. Um, how about my name's Betty today? And no matter what name you put in, the cactus is going to say that's its name too, and then it spins in a circle. So one of the things we'll learn today is how to get input from our user and then use that input in our program, which is a really, really powerful thing and definitely makes it a lot more personal and interactive. Okay, if I click on the dinosaur, she says her name's Izzy and that it's her first day playing the drums. And so as I was coding this one, I was thinking, okay, well, if I were the drum, I would, I would feel a little bit nervous about the idea of being played on by a dinosaur, right? So I thought about what could I do to show some emotion from something that doesn't even have a face. And so what I went with was a shaking motion, just a little random shiver um, to show that the, the thing was afraid and then it says that it's scared. Um, I, I like this training so much because we sometimes have this misconception of coding as being this emotionless, boring, dry thing. Um, but really, we can use it to tell stories and we can use it to have a segue into conversations with our students or with the kids in our lives about things like emotion. How do you show emotion? What are those cues that people use, nonverbal or verbal, to let you know how they are feeling? And then how can we incorporate that into code? How, so this is a really rich uh, experience for both working on some coding concepts and also having those conversations about storytelling and emotion and imagination. So hopefully we're gonna have some fun today. Okay, I'm gonna go to the Scratch website now. Uh, if you are here with me, that is fantastic. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this button up here that says create. That takes me to a new program. Um, in every new Scratch program, it starts out the same way. There is a little cat sprite in the center of a white screen. And that is the start of your program. Um, I'm not going to use the cat today but it is always how every program starts. It doesn't care whether, whether I want to use the cat or not. So to get rid of the cat, I'm just gonna click on this little trash can here by the cat. I'm gonna take a minute to tell you about the different parts of the Scratch window though. This white box here is what our, pro our players will see when they're playing our program. So this is like what we are doing. This is, our, this is our program. Down here is the Sprites menu. And Sprites and Scratch are anything you can associate code with. It could be a character, it could be a bad guy, it could be an item, it could be a button. So anything that you're gonna make that has code is gonna be down here in the sprites menu. I can get new sprites by kicking, clicking on this cat's face. Um, if I don't click on it and I just mouse over it, this kind of thermometer pops up. I can choose a sprite from the Scratch library of sprites. I can paint my own. So if you have students who are interested in creating their own uh, characters, that's something they can definitely do. This one is Surprise, which will just give me a random character. And then this one on top allows me to upload a character um, from, from my computer, okay? Backdrops over here are the same thing. Right now our backdrop is just white. We're gonna start by getting a new one there. Um, and then, this is where our code is going to go, okay? So this screen is where we're gonna bring in our code and it all comes from over here. So are we doing okay so far? Do you, are you kind of with me? You're sort of on the scratch page. We're seeing what I'm seeing. Um, if you're all right, let me know in the comments or unmute yourself either way. So I know whether I need to give you a little bit more time to get logged in or not. Also buying myself time so I can make my cursor giant, make it a little bit easier. All right, I'm not hearing anyone saying that uh, things are bad. It does say my internet connection's unstable, so hopefully that's not the case. Okay, good deal. 
So I'm going to get rid of the cat. And what I'm going to do to get started is I'm going to just choose a random backdrop. This is going to be my inspiration. It's just going to be some surprise and we'll see what the random number generator gives me. Ooh, this looks like a super boring like conference hall or maybe like an indoor storage facility. I don't know that I like this. This does not speak to me about, about stories, but maybe we can make something happen. Okay, um, I'm just gonna choose another random sprite because maybe that'll, that'll get my imagination started because this seems like a terrible place to tell a story. Okay, we got a convertible. This isn't, a, this isn't terrible. And then uh, maybe we'll have something in the convertible. Let's just pick a sprite. Um, yeah, let's, let's get a bear. Let's have a bear in the conference hall and then, uh, let's get some kind of a person. Who should we have? Laura's well, got some different stuff going on. So one of the things I want to point out, um, this is the Scratch library of sprites. You can see that you can sort by different categories up here if there's something in particular you're looking for. As you hold your cursor over these characters, um, you'll see them cycle through the different costumes that are associated with them. One of the great things about Scratch is that they've pre-made different costumes and flipping between different ones can let you see different emotions from your character or different movement. And so we can have that illusion of motion in there. And Nora looks like, Nora looks like they've got some good costumes. Okay. So um, I've got a bear, I've got a convertible, and I've got a person. And this seems like a great situation to be having. Um, I kind of want another vehicle. Like maybe, maybe Nora's going to be in the convertible and the bear is going to have some kind of a car as well, or maybe vice versa. Maybe the bear should be the one in the convertible. Um, and I'm going to go on the internet to find a sprite because that's something that kids are going to want to do. The Scratch Library doesn't have everything a kid could imagine and want to have in their story. And so I want to make sure that you have the understanding of ways to get good images from the internet into Scratch. Okay, so. I'm just going to Google search for cartoon car and we'll see what happens. I'm going to go to the images tab first. So I'm limiting my search to pictures. Um, and then what I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to find an image with a transparent background. Um, if I bring in an image that has a white background, it's going to have a white rectangle around it in scratch and it's not going to look good. So I want to find one that has a transparent background. One way to look for, images with transparent backgrounds is to search for ping, PNG. That file format has, um, has the ability to have transparent backgrounds. Another way is to just kind of hunt and peck around. So here's this car. I'm looking for one here that has a white background, but then when I click on it, it switches to a checkerboard pattern. So I actually got one that worked on the first try, which never happened. So this is a great sign. Um, you'll notice over here, there's no checkerboard. But then once I go into it, I can see the checkerboard. That means that this is a transparent background. The checkerboard shows up in the transparent parts. So I'm going to go ahead and right click on it or control click if you're on a Mac and say save image as. And that'll download it to my computer. And I just need to put it somewhere where I'm going to remember where I saved it to. So I'm just going to save it to my desktop. I do want to caution you. Um, sometimes on here, it will already have a checkerboard and you'll think that that's great and download it and bring it into Scratch. And then you'll realize that it brought the checkerboard with it. These images that look like they have a checkerboard already are ones that have a checkerboard colored background around them. So you want to be careful about that when you're bringing things into Scratch or talking about it. And most of the time when you click on an image with a white background, it will stay white. So like this car would not work for us because it's going to have a white box around it. The last step, nope. <laughs> the last step is to upload that image or that uh, sprite in there, that image of the car. So I'm going to thermometer up to my upload sprite button. 
and then this is the one. It's probably going to be too big because this was a really big image and it's gigantic. This is an easy fix. You'll notice right here I have a size setting. This is 100%. So I want this car to be like 30% maybe. Okay. And then I'm going to make my people and my bear smaller too, or, you know, I'm going to spend some time resizing them. Um, you'll also notice that the sprite has a horrible name. So I'm just going to call it bug and I can rename it there if you don't want it to be called 237994HJ or whatever it comes in as. Okay, so now that I have my sprites, I'm going to play around a little bit with getting them to be the right size and positioning where I want them in my program. And you can take some time to do that with yours as well. Let me know when you're ready for me to go on to the next thing that we're going to do and start actually coding to get our story in. So I did a little bit of fancy stuff playing around over here um, while you're working on your um, getting your sprites arranged and and fitted into your program. Um, I'll just talk a little bit. Scratch supports two different image formats, uh, vector and bitmap, and there there's a lot of complexity in that. But really, basically, vector are images that are defined by math. And so they'll scale really nicely instead of being like it is this many like this is a drawing of a circle and as you scale it up it's going to get grainy. Um, it's basically saying this is a circle it is defined by math so no matter how big I make the radius it still has a nice crisp shape to it. Okay, a uh, bitmap is just a pixel by pixel drawing. Okay, so the images that we're importing from the internet are imported as bitmaps. You can convert them to vector. Um, but they're never going to scale as prettily as the things that are native to Scratch. Although, honestly, this convertible looks like it is a bitmap. So some of the Scratch sprites are, um, excuse me, not vector, but this bear definitely is. Like, this bear is going to scale and do nice things. Um, there's some differences between why they're good or bad. There's not one that's necessarily better than the other. But one thing that I could do because this was a vector um, is I can use this paint bucket and fill it with nothing. So I have all these colors here from this color picker. I have different gradients I can choose. But one of the things I can choose is to not have a background. So I just took out the window on this car so I could see Noor's face through it. 
Okay. Let me know when you're ready to, to start getting into the code of it and have our characters do or say something. Okay, so I'm still kind of thinking about what I want to do here. Um, I definitely want to have a conversation between two characters because that's a really easy first thing to do, but it still gets you into the different um, blocks of code. Okay, so, so okay, let's have, let's have the bear be the start of the conversation. I'm thinking people are probably going to click on the bear first because it's like the biggest thing that looks like you can interact with it. So I'm clicked the bear down here in the sprites menu, which I need to do because this code is now going to be code that's associated with the bear. I cannot tell you how many times I've made the mistake of putting the code I wanted on the bear on one of the cars or some equivalent of that. The thing that you need to do to make sure that you're on the right sprite to code is you click on the character um, and then you'll also see a watermark or a ghost of that character up here. If I could see the ghost, that means that's the character I'm coding. Okay, so down here in events is where we're gonna begin and it's always where we're gonna begin. Events um, are mostly blocks that are called hat blocks. They've got this curved thing on top of them. Um, and these are the blocks that'll start a line of code running. If a line of code is not attached to a hat block, it's not ever going to run. The hat blocks are the triggers. So what the the particular event that I want to get this thing started is I want uh, the bear to be clicked. So I'm going to pull in this one that says when the sprite is clicked and drop it in over here. Okay, now I can put things in place underneath this so that um, the code actually runs. So I'm going to go up to looks because looks is where um, the conversations can happen. This looks are where the say blocks are. And I'm going to drop in the say hello one. Um, and maybe I'm going to have the bear ask Noor, how did you get your car inside? Okay. So now when I click the bear, the bear says, how do you get your car inside for two seconds? If you think that's too long, you can change that amount of time. If you think it's too short, you can change the amount of time. Um, there's a lot that you can do with that that we're not going to get into. But basically, this is what's going to initiate this conversation. Now, I want Nora to respond. Um, but none of these blocks down here make sense for her to respond. She's not going to be clicked. Um, there's no key that's going to be pressed. The, it's not going to be when the program begins. None of these blocks quite work. But we've got these three down here that are message blocks. These are the ones that we're going to want to use. This is a really powerful part of Scratch that allows one user um, initiated thing to initiate a cascade of other things that will happen. So after the bear says, how did you get your car inside? It's going to broadcast bear conversation or something. So I pulled in this broadcast block. I said new message. And then I just typed in something that made sense for me so I would remember what that command was. You can give it any name you like. You can leave it as message one. But I know I'm going to forget what message one went, meant when I come back to this. And so bear convo is going to remind me, OK, this is the one where the bear starts the conversation. 
So I'm going to broadcast that. And that is a message that Scratch then sends out to every other part of this program. So now when I go over to NOR's code, I can bring in when I receive bear convo. So right now, when the bears click, the bear will say something. And then this message is going to go out. I can now code things that attach to that message being sent out. And so I'm going to have her say, what? You're a bear. OK, so she's going to say a couple things. And here's what that looks like. How'd you get console? OK, so now um, I can, I want the bear to say something back. And I have a couple options for that. I could have another message be broadcast, right? So I could have Nora now send a message back to the bear and have a new line of code that's connected to it. But there's another way to do it. In coding, there's almost more than, almost always more than one way to solve your problem. And so it's nice to teach your students about multiple different ways to achieve the same goal. Some of them work better in some situations than others. So we want to be as knowledgeable as possible about different ways to solve problems. So this way, I'm going to go down to control. And this first block in control is a wait block. This is a really important block. In fact, Everything in the control panel is really powerful. This is where the real computer science logical arguments and conditionals come in. Um, the wait block sounds really simple, but it allows you to do some really powerful things. So you'll notice that this is going to take four seconds, right? Two plus two. So if I go over to the bear and I say wait for four seconds, it's going to look like he's waiting for Nora to finish talking and won't interrupt her. And then we'll have something else to say. And maybe the bear's just going to say, well, I never. Okay. And then I think what I'm going to have happen next is the bear's going to back up in his car, like off the screen. But I want to give you some time to process and get your dialogue going. So if you haven't already jumped in on this, go ahead and take a few minutes and get some dialogue going back and forth between your characters. If you want me to switch between screens, just let me know. If you're having issues, just let me know. Um, pop a message into the chat or unmute yourself when you are ready to move on to the next thing.
okay, I've got one person saying they're ready, which is good. Um, if you're not ready, if you're still working on your thing, the next thing I'm going to try to do is a little bit more complicated than I've tried before. Um, and so I'm going to spend some time fiddling with it and you'll have time to go back and get your dialogue finished. So what I want to have happen now is I want the bear to back up and I want the bear and the convertible to back up at the same time. They're two different sprites. There is a way to get them to move in the same manner, but it involves variables and I don't really want to get into variables right now. Um, plus, I think it's going to be fiddly, like just as fiddly as what I'm going to try. So I'm just going to eyeball it. Um, so the bear right now is at X is negative 92 and Y is negative 159. One of the great things about Scratch is that it has this baked in coordinate plane. So you can talk with students about the X and Y axis. Uh, you can also definitely ignore it for younger students. Um, so it's something that's there and it's good to draw your students' attention to how this is the same X, Y plane that we talk about when we're graphing. Um, before I start moving anything, I want them to go back to where they were when they started. So I'm going to put in start conditions, which is a really important part of programming. This stuff is not going to go back to where it was at the beginning of the program the next time someone runs it, unless you tell it to. So we're going to make sure we've got the start conditions for our bear and our convertible before we start moving them around. So to make the start conditions, I'm going to go back to the event menu, which is where all of my hat blocks live, which is where we start things. And I'm going to use this when the green flag is clicked. The green flag is what starts your program. So when I pull this in, anything that clicks in underneath is going to say, this is what you do when the, someone wants to start playing. So to encode a position, I'm going to go up to the motion palette because that's everything that has to do with how things move around the screen. And if you'll notice down here, this go to XY already has these coordinates pre-filled in it. So I can drag my bear around the screen and then this will update and I'll be able to pull it in. So while you can talk about the math, it definitely isn't necessary to understand the math. You can just tell your students to position the bear wherever they want it and then bring in the block and it will update. So I'm gonna bring this in here and then I'm gonna do the same thing on the convertible. I'm gonna to go to events. When the start flag is clicked, go up to motion and XY. And it has a slightly different XY value than the bear, which makes sense because it's not in exactly the same place. Okay, so now I'm gonna start playing around. And if you wanna watch me play around, watch me play around. If you wanna go back to doing your dialogue, it's gonna take me a minute to make this work, I think. Okay. So the bear to back up to there. Oh shoot, that's okay. The convertible backs up to there. Okay. Because I need to get two sprites moving at the same time, I'm going to use another message command. And as far as I know, Scratch has no upper limit on number of messages you can include. As you make things more complicated, they get more complicated, so you want to avoid unnecessary messages. But I can definitely include two and keep it understood. So on the bear, once he says, well, I never, I'm going to have a new message called backup. And now I'm gonna do something a little bit funny that doesn't make sense, but hopefully it's gonna make sense later on and save me some work. Instead of just continuing down this command, I'm gonna bring in this when I receive block and change it to backup. So now the bear has a separate line of code associated with backup. So I'm gonna go up to motion. I'm gonna pull in this XY, which is updated with its new position. I'm gonna be super um, uh, attentive to detail and you notice that the Y coordinate changed a little bit because I'm not perfect at dragging it over. So I'm just gonna put that into the exact same uh, Y coordinate that it was. And then I'm gonna wanna hide the bear. So it looks like he's gone off screen and disappeared. So I'm gonna say hide. Oh, you know what? I didn't want go to actually. I apologize for that. I'm gonna go back up here. Get rid of this. I want glide. Okay, go to just means the bear will be here and then it will appear over here. Glide means it moves through all the places in between. So I definitely want glide. Um, you can see this glide is already populated with the bear's position as well. And so I'm just going to make that little very small tweak there. And now I can do what I was saying. 
So in the looks menu, I have hide. Anytime I use a hide block, I'm also going to want to use a show block somewhere. So I'm just in the habit of anytime I pick up one of these blocks, I bring in the other two. And where does it make sense to show the bear? Probably when the program starts, right? I don't want a disappeared bear to start with. So I'm going to click this um, show block into place right here. The next thing I need to do is with the convertible, I'm going to do something really similar um, where it is going to, when it receives the message back up, it is going to, excuse me, glide to the position it is in right now. I'm going to tweak its Y value again because I just can't help myself. And then I'm going to pull in show and hide blocks. And this is important. If I have this hide um, in front of the glide, you're not going to be able to see it gliding. It's going to glide. It just will not be visible for that. Uh, here, it's less important. It doesn't really matter whether it's shown or goes to that first, because those two things are going to happen basically simultaneously. OK, so I'm going to start my program over, and we're going to see how it looks. So the bear's moving a little bit faster or a little bit farther than the car is. Um, I can definitely make some adjustments to it. And this is what I'm talking about with the fiddly part. So I just want, I don't, I could play around with the speeds of the two things, but I'm going to start by changing and making the car go back farther. So what, negative 230 maybe will work? Let's give that a try. better. Not perfect, better. Okay, so try coding in some movement. It could be completely a separate thing that you do. It could be tied to the code that you're already doing. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can move things around. We talked about glide. Turn is also really fun. You can make things turn in a circle. Um, you can make things move up and down like they're hovering. There's a lot of different things that you can do. And if there's anything that you have a question about that you want to do and you're not sure how to accomplish it, just let me know either in the chat or in um, or unmute yourself and ask. Um, I'm more than happy to talk you through it, but I'm going to give you a couple minutes to work on your code and then I'll show you the next thing I'm going to do. And please let me know if you want me to show you a particular thing.
So the question is, what was the command to get the second character to respond to the first character? And the blocks that you want for that are down in events. It's these when I receive and broadcast. So broadcast is what's going to send out the message. And then on any other sprites page, you can put when I receive. And when I receive will then be what you want to have happen after that message is sent out, probably after one of your characters says or does something. So these are really powerful blocks that can do some really cool things where action is triggered that's not directly dependent on the user. And if that didn't answer your question, keep asking it. Okay, I know what I want to do next. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to get input from my user. I'm going to ask my user a question and then I'm going to use that information that they give me in some way. And so I'm going to click on the um, little what looks like a bug to me. And I'm going to pull in the same when the sprite is clicked. The place where you get the ask command from isn't in looks, which is where I always think to look for it because that's where most of the speech bubble kind of things are. But it's actually down in sensing because it's sensing information from its user. So this ask block right here, um, it says what's your name to start with, but you can have any question be put in there. And then whatever the user answers will get stored in this variable that's already made called answer. Um, all of the variables in Scratch, you can make them visible by checking this box. And so now you can see there's nothing in answer right now because I haven't answered any questions. And I think what I want is when the sprite is clicked, when the little car is clicked, I'm going to have it ask, what do you think my license plate is? Okay, that's a weird question. I know it's been a long day, right? Um, and I'm going to want to use the answer, so I'm going to go ahead and pull it in now. Um, I'm going to have it, I'm going to put in this if then else statement. So I went to control and I pulled then an if then else block. And what this is saying is that if this condition is true, I'll do the first thing. And if it's not true, I'm going to do the second thing in here. And what I want to happen if you don't answer the correct answer, is it'll tell you what its plate number is. So I'm going to say, you know, it's x, y, five, nine, zero. OK. <laughs> and so then um, I need to program it to be able to check to see if the answer that's put in is the same as what it's telling me my license, the license plate is. Uh, so. To do that, to do make that check, I'm going to go down to operators, which is the green menu, which is where all the math lives. And there's some really great stuff in here. Um, so what I'm going to want to put in here, you'll notice that this is a hexagon shaped block. 
in between if and then there's like this hexagon shaped gap there and you'll notice that some of these are hexagon shaped and so i'm going to want the one that says uh, apple contains a question mark and what i'm going to check for is i'm going to check to see if the user's answer contains x y 590. I'll let them put in extra characters, like maybe a question mark or something. Um, and now instead of Apple, I'm gonna pull an answer and you'll notice when I hover it over that gap that says Apple, there's a little white halo that shows up around it. If I drop that in, it becomes part of that um, statement there. And now I'm gonna do the same thing to get it into this gap. So I'm gonna hover it over, it'll expand. And now the um, bug will ask me, and if I give it the right answer, I need to tell it to do something. And maybe I'm going to have it say, okay, so let's, let's test the code. Clicking on the bug. What do you think my license plate is? That's why 590. Okay, it tells me I'm being creepy. So you don't have to get as elaborate as I did with a conditional statement. Um, you can just have it say back part of that answer. Um, and the way you would do that is this join statement. So if you wanted to say something like, if it's if you're asking it, if you're asking the user for their name, then you could just have it say, you know, that's a pretty name or like whatever the name is. And the what that would look like is I would still pull in this answer block, and then I would join that to whatever their answer is. So their name, I put a space, right? Because it doesn't know to put a space in. A pretty name. And then I can just drop that into one of these say blocks. Okay, so <laughs> maybe after that's creepy, I'll just have it say that that's a pretty name for two seconds. Okay, so that's why I maybe. So it just, that join statement allows you to put together um, variables and your own text. And you can nest as many of those as you like. So if you wanted to say something before it repeats the answer and afterwards, you can just bring the join statements in like this for however many you would like it to say, okay? So I'll give you a little bit of time to play around with that. And then I've got my last thing that I'm gonna do um, before I show you how to close out and share your program.
Okay, so my last plan, um, I'm going to go back to how I had backup be a separate thing um, for the bear and the convertible. So I didn't just have my commands uh, heading off of when the bears clicked, and I'm gonna capitalize on that in this last thing. So when the user clicks on Nora, who's really hidden in there, um, I'm gonna have her say something like, look out, my car's out of control. Um, and I don't wanna move her with the car because I feel like that's gonna be a lot of work. So I'm just gonna have her like spin off so she gets out of there. Coding sometimes is harder than you want it to be and that fosters creativity because having her spin out of the car is gonna look kind of fun um, and let us use some different code. And it also gets around the fact that I am lazy and don't wanna figure out how to code her to move back and forth with the car the way that I'm looking for it to. So let's get going. When this sprite is clicked and I'm in NOR, um, so that's, that's the code, that's where I wanna be. I'm gonna have her say, look out. And then she's going to broadcast. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, she's gonna have to broadcast two different commands. She is going to spin out of the way first though. So let's look at that. Um, Let's have her move in two different directions. So let's do here. Oh, and I did a bad thing. I moved her without putting her start position in the first place. And now I've messed everything up, but that's okay. Let's just do start conditions for a second. <laughs> it is what it is. Okay. So I like her where she is now, I hope. Okay, start conditions, good. Um, and then she's going to, yeah, okay. She's gonna broadcast back up. So the bear in the car will back up and get out of the way. And she's also going to broadcast a new message that is out of control, OOC. So this is gonna let me do a couple different things. So not only is it gonna move the bear and the car out of the way, and I'm worried that you lost my feed. So if I was out for a second, I hope I'm back now. Um, it's gonna get the bear out of the way, but then this out of control command is going to allow me to program some things for Nora and the car to do that will only happen in this scenario, not when the bear backs up. And one of the things that's cool that I can do is I can have two different sets of commands for out of control for Nora. So one of these, she's going to glide to over here. And I think, I'm gonna leave her big, whatever, I don't care right now. Okay, so when I receive out of control, I'm gonna glide one second to my current position. And then I am also going to turn 10 degrees. Control is going to repeat a certain number of times and we'll leave it as 10. This repeat block is in the control and it creates a loop where it'll repeat everything that's happening in the loop. Um, so I kind of want to see what's happening here. Here's a problem. Nora's in front of the car and I don't like that. And I can fix that by going up to the looks menu and say, when I start the program, I want to go to back layer for her. I could have sent the car to the front layer too, but, um, that's, that's where I'm at right now. That's what we're doing. Okay. So right now when I click on Nor. She should spin out of the car and let's see what it looks like. <laughs> it looks terrible. What happened? Huh. Okay. So let's, let's try this again. Maybe she needs to just spin more like 30 times. 
oh, and look, she's like not pointing in the right direction either. I need to set another start condition. Uh, one of the things that I like to tell students is that the more complicated you make it, the more complicated you make it. And this is an example of that. I'm trying to do something and I can see so clearly how it should happen in my head. And then I go to program and I'm like, yep, you forgot this, this, and this that you need to take into account when you're doing this. Point in direction is actually in the motion panel and sprites start out at 90. So now that I have this here, we should be okay. Let's try that again. This is the real stuff. Okay, that's better. So she spins out of the car. It's not perfect. The last thing that I want to do is have the bug actually be out of control. So when I go down here, um, I'm going to go down to my control. No, I'm sorry. I'm going to go down to events. When I receive OOC, I'm going to put it in a loop as well. And this time I'm going to use a forever loop. Like this will happen until the end of the game. Um, now I want to go to motion. And I like this glide block. Okay. So I want its Y value to stay the same. I don't want the car to be driving up and down. It's not going to be that out of control. But I want this to change every time the loop runs. So I'm going to go down to my operators menu and I'm going to pick a random number between instead of one and 10, I'm going to have it go the whole length of the um, scratch screen, which is about 240. So I'm going to go from negative 200 to positive 200. Um, and let's see what that does. Let's try this again. Okay, so now it's driving. Sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast. It definitely looks out of control. If I wanted to add more randomness here, I could put in another random value where it's picking the amount of seconds. So sometimes it's moving slowly and sometimes it's moving fast. Um, I could add, I don't like how it, at the very beginning it actually looked like it ran into the other car. So I could put in a loop at the beginning that runs three or four times enough for the bear to get out of the way that just has it move in a much more um, restricted manner. So I've got some options there. But that is, that is the end of my story. Um, and the last thing that I want to do is to talk to you about sharing and saving your game. So you'll notice right now it had said uh, save now. If you ever see that white text right up here that says save now, go ahead and click on it. But Scratch does save things automatically. So you can, um, you can be confident that your students aren't going to lose a ton of work even if they have bad saving habits. So what I'm going to click on now is see project page. And this will take us from inside our code to what our users are actually going to see. I'm going to give my program a name. So we're going to call this Surreal Cars. And then my instructions are just going to be click on the characters to see what happens. My option now is to share this. Once I click this, everyone on the Scratch website can see it. They can not only play and interact with my game, but they can also look inside of it and look at my code, which is a really nice thing to, to have your students be able to do. Okay. I really appreciate you all bearing with me. I'm going to pop a link into the chat that'll take you to the survey that we would love for you to complete. Um, but you will also get a certificate emailed if you do. So I'll make sure you have that. I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording and I'm going to open it up to any questions you have.